here. We've been doing a series this month called Flip the Script, and we're helping, we want to help the body help each other to flip the script, flip what the enemy has told us. Sometimes there's been lies, there's been circumstances in our lives that have reinforced things that have been untrue, and so we, we wake up in the morning and we hear these things, the enemy will whisper them, and he'll continue every day, and he'll cause different circumstances around us to reinforce these things. And what we've been finding, what we've been teaching, is that the enemy, his whole goal is that he would come and kill, steal, and destroy. Yep. But God came and he gave us life and life more abundant. So if we learn his script and what he has for us to live and for us to do and tells us who we are, then we'll be able to live a life full of abundance. We'll be able to live a life that God wants us to. And so this morning, we're going to be tackling another area that the enemy will lie to us. And what's really interesting about lies, or really interesting about deceit, right? When we, sometimes when we're deceived, we don't even know. You know that, right? So if I'm deceived, if I, if, I, if I believe in a lie, if I believe that every time I eat carrots, my eyes eyes are going to, my eyes are going to get better. I'm going to continue to eat carrots, even though we know that that's actually not true, right? And so sometimes the hard, hard part is we, we're deceived and we don't even know. It. So that's why we need the body to yeah. be around us and surround us and remind us, hey. Remember what the script says? Remember what the Word of God says in this area? Or, hey, is that really true about God? Actually, I think you might be believing something that's wrong. Maybe the Satan has gotten a hold of who you are. So this morning, we want to learn about this lie, the script that sometimes we follow that says that we deserve to be happy. Ooh. This is the hard one, right? I don't know why, Andrew, why do you have to go there? But especially we know in maybe even in our uh, America, growing up in America or coming to, to America, we know that in the land of America, it's, it's the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have a whole constitution protecting our ability to pursue happiness. And so it becomes who we are that, hey, I want to, some people even, hey, I want to move to America because I know I can pursue my happiness. But everyone, I believe everyone that has believe this lie or follow this script that I deserve to be happy has done something that God didn't want them to do. Yeah. Because they believe a lie. Hey, I deserve to be happy. Let's turn to uh, first scripture this morning. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And we've got to remember, as we're going through these flips of scripts, these lies, they don't, they don't um, have power over us unless we believe them to be true. Right. So this is, remember, these, these are lies, they're things that are false, but they only become the power over us, they only hold power over our lives if we believe them to be true. And when we do, then we find out sometimes we get in some mess. But on 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we just wanted to remind, remind us that the reason why we're going through the script is because we don't want to be unaware. See, verse 11 says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So we don't want to allow these lions to rule over us because we don't want to become unaware that the enemy has a scheme, and his scheme is always to destruct, to kill, and destroy, right? To kill, steal, and, to steal and destroy. So we said, no, as believers, we need to we need to know the script, right? So we talked about in um, the first message that we need to read the script. We need to research the script. They take some time, like the Bereans, right? They said everything that was said, they looked up and searched out. So we need to read the script, research the script, and even rehearse the script. And we talked about, you know, some, some of us did theater. I did theater when I was in high school, and I remember, you know, we had to read the script, memorize the script. And it wasn't just your parts that you had to learn. You had to learn everybody else's, so you knew your part in the play. And, and hey, even you could help out the say lines of other people, right? So we, we need to know the script if we're going to be able to overcome these lines. So the funny thing is, is we, if we begin to believe the lie, we deserve to be happy, we find actually that we actually end up being more unhappy. Do uh, you ever notice that? Sometimes like, I, I go after something that I, I believe is going to make me happy, once I get that, I, I become unhappy. But actually, uh, it's really interesting, there's been multiple stories, if we look through the Bible, of people that said, you know what, I think this is going to make me happy. And when they did this, or they did that, it was opposed to what God planned for their life. And it didn't turn out very well. There's a few examples of this, that I want to go after something because I want to be happy. So remember Eve, right? We've talked about this a few times. Eve, what did she think was going to make her happy? 
She thought eating that fruit, eating that piece of fruit, that's going to make me more happy. It's going to better my life. I'm going to uh, eat that piece of fruit. Huh? Well, no, that didn't turn out well. And it entered, as she ate that fruit, and sin entered her life. And, for the, and now all of humanity has this issue with sin. Or Cain. Or right afterwards. Cain thought killing his brother would make him happy. I want to I get rid of my brother because he's better than me. I want to I get rid of him and it's going to make me happy. Well then, what happens? He's marked and he's actually marked as a lonely stranger that's going to roam the earth. Oh. And Esau, he thought eating soup would make him, or getting his father to eat the soup would make him happy. Some of these stories I know we'll learn more in detail as we go on. But um, Noah, he thought getting drunk would make him happy, which actually brought a curse on his family. Uh, David thought sleeping with another man's wife would make him happy. Well, that only caused destruction, and actually at the point of his rule and reign, that was the, from that point on, there was, uh, it began to lessen and lessen the, the rule and authority that he had. Uh, so it didn't work out, he didn't quite get happy. Joseph thought that, uh, Joseph's brothers thought that selling Joseph into slavery would make them happy. That didn't turn out that well, and they actually ended up having to go to Joseph and, and to receive a blessing during a time of famine, right? Samson thought marrying a Philistine woman when he wasn't supposed to would make him happy. It only caused destruction and caused him to be uh, to be imprisoned. And, and then later, finally giving, being able to do a redeeming part of tearing down the, um, the sorry, tearing down the building. But then later, Jonah, he actually thought going to Nineveh would make him unhappy. I don't want to, I don't, God, you told me to go to Nineveh, but I think that's actually going to make me unhappy. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go on the boat. Well, then a storm comes, and he gets thrown over, right, and, and ends up in the belly of a well. So Jonah, he wanted to avoid what God was telling him because he thought it would make him unhappy. Solomon, he had 999 wives and thought, one more wife would make me happy, but he found out, well, that's not going to make, that didn't make me any happier. Um, we look at it in the New Testament, right? The rich young ruler, he thought his wealth was going to make him happy, and Jesus confronted him about following him, and he said, go sell everything, and he said, I don't think so. I don't think that will make me happy. I think what I have is going to make me more happy. Um, Judas, he was a pretty serious one. Judas, he thought trading 30 pieces of silver would make him happy. And he traded the life of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and found out that didn't make him happy at all. Actually caused him to be depressed. Ananias and Sapphira, they thought keeping some money and lying about how much uh, they got for their land was going to make them happy. It didn't turn out very well for them. And then the New we find out Ananias and Sapphira both died as they lied to God. But I can even turn these stories around and make them maybe more modern, something that maybe we would all relate to. And so these names that I put on here are all fictional, so they, they aren't towards anybody in this room. Um, so I purposely tried to make sure I didn't use a name that would be represented this morning. So if I did, I apologize. But I believe there are some modern stories also that we find. Sometimes Mark thought that looking at porn would make him more happy, or Sarah thought getting deeper and deeper in debt would make her more happy as she would get more and more possessions, but it found out that once she got them all, it would make her happy. Um, some guy, Bill, embezzled some money from his company because he thought that would make him happy when he found out it only desired more for him to do, get and only cost his life to be destroyed. Katie thought sleeping with him might make him love her, which end up being loved, and she would receive the love from him, but that didn't make her happy either. Alan thought that drinking one more drink would make him happy, or at least would forget how unhappy he was for a moment. But on and on we see these stories of people that pursue this lie, this script that the enemy has given them, that you deserve to be happy. And as we follow this script, we find that many times we find ourselves in a position against who God is. So what's hard about this is when I thought about you deserve to be happy, I would think people would ask, well, of course, God wants me to be happy. Doesn't God want me to be happy? And I would say, well, yes, God wants us all to be happy. But oftentimes, the happiness that we pursue is contrary to biblical happiness. The enemy tries to get us to live our lives by this script. And when we find this script of you deserve to be happy, we find ourselves in the middle of what psychology would call the pleasure paradox. Have you ever heard of that? That when we pursue, the worst thing that we can do is pursue our own pleasure. Actually, when we, when we make pleasure 
and happiness, the center of who we are and what we're doing, our own happiness, then we actually find ourselves becoming more and more miserable because the very thing that we center ourselves around, our happiness, we find that it's more and more elusive. Do you ever get that next job that you wanted or that next uh, situation? Maybe you have one more kid and you're like, oh, this is going to make me happy. Or if I, hey, I want to get married and that's going to make me happy. And then you get married and you find out, actually, I want to be single. That would make me happy. Or if I'm single, I, you know, right? We have this paradox. Once we get whatever we were desired to make myself happy, once I get it, now, it's, now that happiness is more elusive. It's the next thing that I have to do. It's actually a, psycholo it's a psychologist that um, studied this and say it's, the, it's this pleasure paradox. Once we go after something, actually, we, we miss what we we're actually pursuing. But I do believe that God is a good father, and that he does desire for us to have a life that is full of peace, full of joy, full of love, full of meaning. But we have to understand that the cultural phenomenon, this pursuit of happiness that, as we live in America for this time, is so important to us that actually the, the happiness that pursuing is different than what our culture says it is. So we're going to go through today some comparisons, some comparing what cultural happiness would say, and then what biblical happiness would say. What is this true happiness that, that we that God desires us to pursue after, and how does how has the enemy twisted that so that actually robs us of what God desires for each one of us now? Let's this morning pray before we go in further to the message. Father, I thank you that you are with us this morning. I thank you, Father, that uh, you desire good things for us. Father, I pray that as we speak these points and as we hear these points this morning, that our hearts would be gripped, that we would desire, Father, to be uh, to pursue happiness in a way that honors you. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's say the first point here is that, and if we're talking about the cultural happiness, what is cultural happiness? It's based on, one of the things that it's based on is the pursuit of pleasure. So we talked about this. We want to do anything that would make us happy, that I would enjoy that moment. And you know, if we talk, if we're really honest this morning, we talk about the different areas in which we pursued happiness or we pursued our own pleasure. Uh, we would say that momentarily it does give us some pleasure. I remember when I first got married. I was saying this morning I loved um, having a really nice TV. And so for the first week, I would I would go and I would purchase a, uh, a TV. Well, actually, I would borrow money to purchase. Anyway, and uh, right, uh, so I get this nice TV in the living room, and I loved it. I was like, "Oh, the picture is so clear and crisp." Well, then, if you know anything about technology, not too long after that, the next new thing comes out, and you got the next new picture. So I said, "Okay, well, let me return this TV, and I'll get this next one." And then, uh, you know, I found myself doing this over and over again. Probably had six TVs within the first first year that we were married because I was trying to. You know, I wanted, and I felt that pleasure at first, and then all of a sudden I realized after the last one, I got this hibachi TV, a plasma screen TV, that you could sit on your couch, and you could use the remote to turn the angle of the TV. So I was like, this is really neat. I could get the best, uh, the best angle of the TV where no matter where I was sitting, and I thought it was amazing. <laughs> but then after, shortly after that, then I realized, now I gotta pay for this thing. I don't even. I got to do part. Rachel and I were in part-time jobs and going to college full-time. You know, and so there is a moment of this pleasure, right? We go after this and we pursue it, but there's a moment of pleasure. But then in, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that it go after it, but it's like the wind. So you try to grab wind, you try to grab uh, the air, right? And then the air just leaves, right? So this, this pursuit of happiness, cultural happiness, so is based on this. I'm going to go after what I'm going to find pleasure in that's going to please me, that's going to make me feel better in the moment. And then for some time in the moment, it does. But then after that, it's when the breath comes in. And after that, it's when we find out, boy, that wasn't actually pleasing to myself, to my family, to God. And we say, wow, they, they would find themselves in the conundrum. Well, let me go after this next thing. And so that's how this cycle of happiness continues. It doesn't last. So let's change this now. What is, the, what, would it, what is the basis of the biblical happiness? It's the pursuit of this really hard word sometimes for us to receive. But it's the pursuit of holiness. Yeah. And sometimes I've heard growing up, and I've grown up in church before, maybe you've heard something similar to this, that uh, people have said, God doesn't want you to be happy, he wants you to be holy. Or maybe you've heard something similar, maybe, um, he doesn't want you to be happy, he wants you to be obedient. Has anybody heard something like that before? Well, I hate hearing those things because it, it, it 
contrast where it makes two things opposed to each other that are actually go hand in hand. So if we say that God doesn't want you to be happy, He wants you to be holy, He actually, His holiness brings happiness. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. So sometimes we have believed for a while, oh, if I have to be holy, then I'm going to have no fun. If I want to be righteous, or I'm going to be like God, it's going to be no fun, it's going to bring no pleasure to me. Well, that's the totally opposite. Actually, it says that if, in Matthew chapter 5, right, it said, blessed or happy are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for what reason? They will be filled. That's right. So if we're pursuing, if we're, if we're in a pursuit, all that pursuit of who God is and what He wants for my life, that's actually going to bring us the most happiness that we can have. It's going to bring us the most joy that we can have because we're going to be in cooperation with what He, and how He has designed us to be. See, culture tries to pin us against ourselves and say, "No, if we pursue everything you want. That is going to bring you pleasure." And the Bible says, "Actually, no, no. We are living for somebody other than yourself, and that brings you." Happens. Your pursuit of holiness actually causes you to be filled. Let's turn to Psalms 1. Psalms 1 is this amazing chapter that again reinforces that our happiness is found when we are pursuing after God. Psalms chapter 1. I want to learn a little bit later, but this word blessed, the word blessed and happiness are go together in, in Scripture. And so in some of your versions, if you're reading NIV, you see the word blessed, and in other versions, you'll see the word happy here. But it says here in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Blessed or happy is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, take or, take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on His law day and night. That person... The describing this person who's delighted in his happiness in God, who desires to go after righteousness, to guide to go after, after holiness, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in his season, and whose leaf do not wither. Whatever they do, they prosper. And then in contrast here, the second part of that, in contrast, those who go out for witness, like chaff, like in the wind, blowing to and fro. And so, we see here as we pursue God, we have this fruit, and it does produce fruit in its season. So we have this hope that in season there is going to be produced. Sometimes if we learn, we're going to learn in the next couple points that you know Paul found himself in unhappy situations, in prison, he shipwrecked, beat, all these kind of things. But well, what is it about a person that is pursuing God? That they're like a tree. That even in, in the midst of hard situations, there's still life in them. There's still a joy. There's still a happiness. And I can go through situations, and there's still this happiness because I know I'm going after something that's going to give me what I need. So first point is, there's a, there's a, there's a difference between culture happiness. It's a pursuit of self. And the, and the other is it's a pursuit of holiness. So let's look at another thing that cultural happiness is based on. It's based on circumstances. Oftentimes, uh, this script that says you deserve to be happy also correlates with the if only script. <laughs> right? So if only this situation would change. If only this would be, if only I had a better job, if only I had a different house, if only I had a better family. A, no, anyway, um, so if only I had a, a baby, if only I had health, if only this, if only that, I would be happier, right? This starts this pursuit, this comparison. If only I had one more thing, I, I could change my life, everything would be good. But what we find here in America, here in America, that in, um, if we did this survey of happiness, that we actually are a less happy people now, even though we have more ability yeah. to, to get things. The, the people are now ten times more likely to be depressed if you were born after 1945. Oh, there's a little, little, uh, a little time frame there, but after you're ten times more depressed than to be uh, than the previous generation. So you're you're more likely to be unsatisfied with what's going on in your life now, even though there's more things for us to get and to get the change, right? Wow. Because when you think about our circumstances, and we always say, what is one thing? It's always greener on the other side. We always have this idea that if I could only get that one more thing, it's going to satisfy me. 
But here is the foundation of a biblical happiness is that our our happiness is based on Christ. Amen. So as a believer, it's based on Christ. Why is that so foundational? Why does that change when we think about happiness? Why does that change the results, our feelings, our emotions, and all these? Because Christ is the one that cannot change. He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can't change. And so when we base our, our happiness, our joy, our, our all of who we are on Him and our relationship with Him, it changes things. Let's look at Philippians. We talked about Paul. Let's turn there. Paul, man, he went through some stuff. Right? Yes. Look at Paul's life and said, okay, I think I got it easy. But Paul in Philippians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 11. Been through some stuff. Anybody else been through some stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. A little. A little bit? We live life? Like you, all, you all are living life? Alright, Paul, he's in uh, Philippians. It says this in verse 11. I am not saying this. All right, let's 10. Start at 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no, no opportunity to show it. So I rejoice in that. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, content in whatever circumstance I'm in. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. We know that would be on both sides of the coin. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What is the secret? I need, I need to know. What is, what is the secret? 13. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. So Paul has put his life, his foundation that he stands on is Christ himself. And he knows that when I have this relationship with Christ, then no matter what may come my way, it's not going to move me. It's not going to change me. I could be high, I could be low, I've had all the different circumstances. I've been, you know, if we go into story, prison, I mean, he said, no, my foundation is Jesus. And I know when I, my foundation is on Jesus, there's nothing that can happen, no circumstances that can surround me that can rob me of my joy. Right? So no mechanical issues on your car, no breaking of your fridge. My fridge broke last week and we lost all the food. And we had we actually had and we live in an apartment, we're on like the bottom floor, and so the pipe, the drain pipe for all of the apartment is right underneath uh, my apartment. And, and so it it was clogged with a whole bunch of vegetables this week and grease and nastiness from all of my other neighbors. And so it overflowed into my apartment this week. And so there's nothing I had to remind myself, there's no circumstance that could take away the joy that I have because nothing in this world around me can change my relationship with Christ. Amen. That He's for me. Amen. That He's my strength. Amen. It's testing sometimes. <laughs> it's testing last week when the hailstorm came through, and all I could do was just watch my car out there be tilted with hail, and you know, it's testing. When the professor didn't tell me what the paper was due today or the test, or my wife is this, or my husband's that, or my child's not going to be quiet here, and I want them to do this. And But my relationship with Christ is my strength. Mm -hmm. It holds me. But it can shape my happiness. A nice New Testament scholar that says this about our happiness. He did, it, our happiness is described, or described, that joy which has its secret within itself, that which is serene and untouchable, a self-contained, that joy which is completely independent of all the changes and dangers of life. That's the kind of happiness we have when we know our relationship with God cannot change. It cannot alter. It cannot be shaken. It can't be taken from me. If the enemy wants to kill, kill, steal, and destroy, the one thing he can't touch is my relationship with Christ that never changes. In John 16, 22, uh, Jesus encourages his disciples. He tells them, hey, I will see you again, and you will rejoice. No one will take away your joy. Amen. So we know that we have a hope that Jesus is returning for us. Our security, our future is secure in him. And so when we hold on to that, man, nothing can rob us of that joy. I know Jesus has come back for me. I know my relationship with him is secure. I know, and nothing is going to shake me. Amen. In 
Jesus spoke those words to disciples, and each one of the each one of the disciples were executed for their faith. No, I mean, like I can understand that. I, I, I don't go do that. Okay, I talk about the drain messing up and the fridge breaking and maybe I had to pay extra money on my grocery bill this month. But when Jesus was speaking at his disciples, he was telling them, hey, you're going to face death for me, but nothing's going to rob you of your joy because you will see me. Right? We will see him and nothing can rob us of our joy, of our happiness, when our, when our happiness is based on a relationship. So let's look at the next couple um, things. Our, cult our cultural happiness is often fueled by comparison. Uh, oh, I hate that. Yes. Right? So my life compared to everyone else. And as Pastor was mentioning last week, the hardest thing is, is when now that social media is so popular, we often compare ourselves to other people's best. Right? We don't, he was mentioning, right, when you when post on Facebook, right, we don't put up, like, the I just woke up uh, pictures, unless it's the I just woke up and I have makeup on still, or I have my hair perfect, right, then we can, then we, then we, we'll post those. And we, 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 we always post the successes in our life, right? So now we're, with a view that we have of other people's lives is that their life is perfect. So whenever I compare my life to that, it's always going to look bad, right? So I, it's going to be great if I want to have a lack of happiness, man, if I'm trying to compare myself to everybody else, because, hey, there's some people in this room even that, that have, I think, some some benefits that I don't have, and it's, it's going to cause me to, to fail, it's going to cause me to uh, be unhappy, but it also, you know, it, 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 the enemy is going to reinforce this, you deserve to be happy, you deserve to have that life, you deserve to have what everybody else has, go after it, and it's going to encourage us to work after that thing that we can't actually obtain ourselves. It robs us of our happiness when we actually try to compare ourselves to others. Now on the flip side, biblical happiness, if, if cultural happiness is fueled by comparison, biblical happiness is fueled by gratitude. I'm going to be thankful in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. so I'm not going to be thankful for, I'm not going to be thankful for all circumstances. I'm not thankful that my drain overflowed or my fridge, right? That's just great. But in all circumstances, I want to be thankful. I'm thinking about I have a roof over my head. It may not be perfect. I may have all sorts of neighbors that cram things down their thing. And God, I'm grateful I have a place to stay. God, I'm grateful for my family. And it changes our perspective on me. Now, I don't want, to, when in saying that, I don't want to make light of the situations we're going through. So I know there's people in this room, and even myself, there's greater things than just my dream overflowing this week that we're going through. And I don't want to make light of that. But as we're going through that, what is going to keep our happiness, what is going to keep our place of joy in our heart is our gratitude, is our thankfulness of who God is. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, give thanks in all things. In all things. I want to give thanks. I want to be thankful. God, there's so many things. There's a study by um, Emmons and McAuliffe says they, they took two groups of people. They said, each one of you guys are going to keep a journal. The first the journal you're going to keep, and you're going to write down everything that makes you happy. And you, everything you spot that you're thankful for, just write it all down. And the other group, maybe sometimes I'm in this group, but they're going to write down everything that annoys you. Just write it down. Just keep track. Everything <coughs> one group, you're right, you're all, everything's thankful, gratitude, your thing, thing. And the other side, okay, you're going to be, uh, everything's going to be annoying in my life, everything that annoys me and gets on my nerves, just keep track. And so as they, as they, as they studied this out, they, um, they found, I think it's pretty obvious, I think, as, as we're believers, but they found that those who um, took note of everything that they're thankful for, everything that they have gratitude for, they, they found a whole bunch of increases in their life. They said that they increased their energy, their enthusiasm, they were less depressed, they were more happy, their, their, even their countenance was more full of joy. And some people may, maybe look to your neighbor you know, right, and say, hey, maybe you need to be more thankful, right? I don't know. Uh, maybe get some happiness on your face again. Maybe better than uh, some beauty sleep, but just need to be great. See, the script will try to convince us of our, that our happiness will come when we compare ourselves to others. Rather, as biblical believers, we would say that I have the happiness I have, the greatest happiness I have, I have it right now in Christ. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to a 
strong truth at the end that's it's just powerful. But in Philippians uh, 4, verse 7, it talks about bringing all of our needs, all of our prayer, all of our requests to God. And he says to do it all in thanksgiving. And what will happen as we thank God for these things? It says the peace that passes understanding will guard our hearts and our minds. As a grateful, as we, if we stay in an attitude of gratefulness, then it changes who we are. It brings peace into our life. It brings joy. We get to experience. We know that the greatest thing that we could ever get, we have. The greatest thing we could ever get, we have. And that's Jesus. So let's look at another area this morning about cultural happiness, physical happiness. Cultural happiness is focused on self. Focused on self. So we become the center of our world, right? Yes. In our culture specifically, right? It's exalted this idea of individualistic uh, nature of things. And I, I'm, I am the center of everything. Like, I exist to please myself. I exist to be happy. I exist to succeed. I, I exist for all the things. And as we focus on that as, as the culture happiness, then of course I'm going to pursue the things that may oppose who God is. Right? Remember that life, it, it does sound good. We deserve to be happy. But God wants to be happy. Right? But oftentimes when we pursue, continue to pursue that for self, then self gets in the way. Then we begin to do things that are opposed to who God is. And that's when our, our happiness is altered, because then we find ourselves in a mess. But when we pursue God and, and for Him and for others, then all of a sudden it changes and our, our, our happiness begins to increase in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 26, it talks about Moses. And it says this, it says that he chose, if we choose God, our that he chose God over the fleeting pleasures of sin and looked ahead to the great reward. So that is a deeper happiness. It's not just about self. It, there is a pleasure in pursuing sin. There is this immediate kind of, oh, feeling of joy, but it's in the repercussions of that afterwards that we find that the actual what we pursue is not even what God desired or what we even wanted, the outcome that we desired. So culture, it says, Focus on self. Focus on your own. It's really interesting as we talk about biblical happiness, that as a biblically happy person, our focus is on others. How can I increase the joy of others? We think, we think we'll be happy if we fill ourselves with things from the outside. But actually, we take from what's inside of us and give it to others. Sometimes we want, hey, if I can just get more money, Right? More, more children, more staff, more, more family members, more pleasure. It'll make me happy. But actually, as we give to others, man, we find our true happiness. And, and in this, we model who Christ is. Because Christ, right, he came not to be served, but to serve. Amen. And we find, you ever, those moments, I've gone on different mission trips, or even, you know, those moments, uh, Pastor mentioned Megan giving to the man on the street, those moments of giving where you find pure joy when you can bring pleasure to somebody else's face. Yes. And I'm like, wow, that's really neat. When, I, when I'm talking with Rachel and I know I give her a gift that just makes her that makes her light up and enjoy, I'm like, wow, oh, that makes me feel completely, makes me feel special. When you serve others, there's even some psychologists that would say that they, they found this also, that it's ironic that people focus on doing stuff for themselves, they actually get more depressed. Right? They, they try to grab it and it goes away and they get more depressed. But when they focus on others, they seem to get happiness thrown in. Yeah. When I read that this week, I was thinking it's almost like we were designed that way. <laughs> Amen. Right? They were designed to give to others. And the psychiatrist was noticing when, when they do that, when they give to others, it's almost like they get happiness added to <coughs> in with the deal. Puzzles, puzzles. When I don't know, believer thinks about spiritual things, sometimes it gets them really puzzled, right? But it's almost as if we're designed that way. We're designed to, to give to others in, in return as a blessing, as a happiness that we receive. This morning, there's a couple other points I can make on, as we compare cultural happiness and biblical happiness. I could talk about uh, cultural happiness being 
foundation is based on feelings, right? That they go, it feels good to me in a moment, I'm going to go after this, it's going to make me happy, uh, compared to uh, as biblical happiness, faith. Romans 8, 28, that there's a, there's a faith that we have that we receive these things from God, right? Or I could talk about um, cultural happiness is found in chasing, right? We've got to chase after we've got to get it, instead of understanding that it's about receiving from God, we receive happiness, we receive joy, we receive love, we receive it by grace, by something we believe, and He gives it to us freely, not by the works that we've accomplished. Yeah. We get these things from God, through grace, through Jesus Himself. So the script about pursuing, or the script that says we deserve to be happy can sometimes end us up even more unhappy than when we started. Mm -hmm. But the enemy loves to tell us that. You deserve yes. to be happy. Just one more time. It's, it's all right. You deserve to be happy. Yeah. You, deserve, you deserve it. You, you worked really hard. You deserve to take a break here. But no, true happiness comes when we, pers when we have an all-out pursuit for God. And when we have all our pursuit for God, it says in, in that right that we receive, we're filled, we're satisfied. Mm -hmm. I love that feeling of being satisfied. So what I was thinking as I was as we've been um, learning these messages, flip the script, um, and like we said, we've been listening to some other preachers also that have been saying this, and I love the way one of them summed up this whole lie about we deserve to be happy. So when we talk about we deserve to be happy, um, what truth can we believe that would help us with this? Well, one, we can think about like all of these, all of these good scriptures that we just read today. And, but yeah, okay, I want that kind of happiness. That, ha that happiness is what I desire. But really the truth that will help us flip the script is that we don't deserve to be happy. We deserve to go to hell. It's true. Nobody's laughing at that. Sorry. It's true. So we don't deserve to be happy. Our 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 plot in life is as our plot in life because of the sins that we've done, because of the things that we've committed against God, is hell, is death, right? Romans. Mm -hmm. The wages of sin is death. Now if I just stop there, I don't think too many people would pursue I think that really just all depressed. I'm like, Andrew, you're not trying to make us depressed this morning. You're trying to build us up, right? I said, yes, I'm trying to build us up and encourage us. Because if we just stop there, it's not the whole story, right? So yes, we don't deserve to be happy. We do deserve hell. We do deserve death. But the whole picture is that Jesus saved us, and that way we should be happy. Jesus saved us, and he took away this penalty of sin. It gives us this solid relationship with him. It changes Everything about who we are, when we submit our lives to Jesus, all of a sudden, everything changes. Man, it's not about me anymore. Man, I have peace and understanding because I know my future is secure. I know I have, I can go through my day no matter what the circumstance is because I have the power of God that's living inside of me. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is now in me. Amen. No matter what I face in this world, I, it won't overcome me. I have Jesus. Amen. Gospel gets really exciting. Because it changes who I am. I don't have to be the statistics that says I'm going to be more depressed and less happy than the previous generation. No, I can have the happiness of God because I want to pursue Him. And I want to be like a tree planted by water that, that won't grow weary, that won't faint. I'm, that's the kind of relationship, that's the kind of life that God desires for me when we begin to believe His script over the script of the enemy. So this morning, in closing, I wanted to talk about two areas of response to this. One, when we talk about this happiness that comes from Jesus, it comes when we receive it. When we say, you know what? Jesus, I desire to live for you. He has done this on the cross. Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us, the whole gospel is that we were born sinners, we, we have all sinned, and we've all fallen short of who God is. But when Jesus came, He gave us life. And He removed the penalty of our sin. We had a penalty to pay, but Jesus paid it for us. He died on the cross in my place, in your place. And when we receive that forgiveness that He's in, and make a decision to, to live for Him every day of our lives, to live as Him as King of my heart, 
His, the reward that we have in Him is eternal life. It is life and life more abundant. Oppose the, the enemy. The enemy says destruction, but in Christ and Jesus, we have life and we have it abundantly. Holiness is not opposed to happiness. Holiness is not so So when we submit our lives to Jesus, maybe it looks daunting at first because, hey, I, I, I think I'm kind of happy with where I am. But when we trade it for what He has, our, our, it changes everything and He gives us the best. So this morning, maybe you're in the boat and you said, you know what, I, I have never submitted my life to Jesus. I've never made that decision that, hey, I want to follow Jesus with my whole life. I'm going to give up my own pursuit of happiness and I'm going, to, I'm going to receive the pursuit of happiness that God has for me. Maybe you're in that boat this morning and you need to make a decision, hey, I am deciding to follow Jesus today. But the others, the others of us in this room, you, you may have been hearing the sermon, you maybe God, the Holy Spirit was speaking to you and He was telling you, you know what? You've been pursuing happiness on your own. You've been pursuing happiness apart from me. And maybe you were quick to realize destruction that has come to your life because you pursue happiness apart from what God desired for you. And this morning you would say, yeah, Father, help me to pursue happiness, biblical happiness, happiness that is pleasing not only to you, but actually brings me true peace for me, true joy, bring me true love, bring me true experience of your blessings. And you need to take time this morning to pray and say, Father, forgive me for those times that I have pursued my own happiness apart from your happiness. Mm -hmm. So this morning, let's bow our heads as we respond to the word.